Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Tuesday, May the 22nd, 2018 session in our series on entrepreneurship and Asian high-tech industries. I'm Richard Dasher. I direct the U.S. Asia Technology Management Center. We produce this series with support from our member companies, which include Bridgestone Corporation, Brilliant Hope Incorporated, uh, Mitsubishi Research Institute, NEC Corporation, and Litsumeikan University. So I'm very happy that you can all come today, and I hope you'll plan to stay after our formal session is over. We will have some refreshments outside and be sure and, and meet our panelists. So we always try to have one session in these series on entrepreneurship to look at the, the whole situation with social entrepreneurship. And I think that we have a great focus for our session this year on social entre entrepreneurship, which is really the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and how both technology development and social entrepreneurship are important ways in which to approach those goals. Uh, we've got a great panel to talk about this. Sitting closest to me is Ms. Radhika Shah. And Radhika, I know, as the co-president of Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs India. And Radhika is also an... U.S. Stretcher. Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs are here, not in India. Here, oh, yes. right. Correct. Sorry about that. That's Paula. There is a chapter in India. Yes, and Paula. But, is okay, there. Paula's doing yes. that. Okay. Mutual friends. Mutual friend, which is why. Yeah. Radhika is also an advisor uh, on the United Nations Strategic Development Goals. And so she will talk considerably about that. Um, she's an advisor to, uh, she's a founding chair of the Technology Advisory Group for the Stanford Handa Center on Human Rights. And she sits on the International Advisory Network for Business and Human Rights Resource Center. Uh, she's been an advisor and a mentor and a judge at various accelerator programs such as Stardex here and also Impact Experience, Skydeck Labs at Berkeley, uh, Illumin Capital, A Fund of Impact Funds. Um, and we're really happy that Radhika can be with us. She's got a master's in computer science from Stanford and an MBA from Berkeley. Uh, so that's why you wind up mentoring at both schools. Yeah. Uh, and also with us today is Mr. Rikin Gandhi. And Rikin is co-founder and executive director of Digital Green, which is a global development organization that is really aimed at empowering smallholder farmers to really get out of poverty by harnessing technology and also by doing grass-level partnerships. Uh, he started his career at Oracle. He later joined Microsoft Research. Uh, he has traveled extensively around the rural communities in India and really um, started this, I guess, in uh, 2006. This project really comes from back then. So I'm going to ask each of our panelists to give us some prepared remarks. And after they've both given prepared remarks, I'll ask one or two questions to get the discussion going, and then it'll be Q&A. So there'll be plenty of opportunity for you to uh, have an interactive part in this session. So Radhika, why don't you go first? Your slides are up. Sure. Thrilled to be here, back in Richard's class, one of my favorite places on campus, and with an awesome Ashoka fellow, Rickin. I'll start by a little bit of context on the Sustainable Development Goals. In September 2015, several world leaders, almost all world leaders, gathered at UN headquarters in New York and came up with one of the most ambitious set of goals ever. These goals unify development, human rights, and uh, looking at climate change. They're very comprehensive, things like eliminating poverty, hunger, providing quality access of education, water, energy to all, every single world citizen in the next 15 years, now 13 years from now. And not just that, all the world leaders committed to making this happen and have started initiatives. So it's a very key moment right now. 
These goals are also about leaving no one behind. And that is very unique and different than past goals. And also, they're very universal in that it's the recognition that we are at a crisis point in the world, both on where inequality is, how extreme it is, and climate change, where the issues are not just in developing parts of the world, they're different issues in every part of the world, in America, in Europe, in India, in Africa. So that recognition is very important. And also the thinking that let's look at solutions local as well as global, and let's all collaborate to make these things happen. So these goals weave social, economic, and environmental goals. And the other unique thing is these goals recognize that there's an integrated aspect here. When you work on water problems, it impacts women. When you work, when you work on health, when you work on energy, it impacts poverty, so recognition about the interlinkedness of these goals. So today we'll look at two, two levers that are very powerful in helping advance these goals, and one of them is social entrepreneurship. Social entrepreneurs have actually been working for a long, long time on these goals. Um, people like Rickin and Ashoka Fellows, other Ashoka Fellows, Echoing Green Fellows, they've been looking at the biggest challenges in society. They've been tackling change and coming up with amazing innovations. And this is going to be critical, that this way of looking at social and environmental missions and bringing the spirit of entrepreneurship is going to be very important if we are to come up with a disruptive kind of innovations that are nonlinear, that really scale at, at a global level. If we are to come up with those, social entrepreneurship is going to be critical, and we'll need to really bring this, make this kind of a way of doing things, a norm, and make it much more mainstream. And this is where people like Rickin are going to be the trailblazers to change the world. And the world needs many more change makers. And as Ashoka would say, it's the moment for everyone to be a change maker. It's, it's that moment when all of us need to be part of this moment. And um, on a different front, many people ask, why? What's, what's special about this moment? These SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, have been enshrined as rights in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights for a long, long time. So, so what if people have come up and created these goals? And what is different is that it's one thing to have these in some documents, but it's very different when there is a time frame, when these are reframed as goals, when all world leaders come together and say, we're going to make this happen and start taking action. And what is important is that many organizations have started around these goals. And for the first time, we have a universal language and a framework that all of us understand and agree on that what is social change and sub, sub kind of, it's a taxonomy with uh, sub levels as well. And that is really changing how we're doing things. Another very unique thing that's happening at this moment in the world is technology is becoming the new oil of the economy. It is becoming a game changer in good and bad ways. We can, th there are of course amazing things we can do with technology, but a lot of negative externalities we need to recognize. We need to think of how to use technology in an accountable and responsible way. And can yeah. I um, interrupt you? Yeah, of course. What do you mean by oil? Do you mean it makes it move smoother, or is it like big <laughs> oil? Oil. I, I mean that it makes it move smoother and okay. faster, and okay. more than that, it is becoming the infrastructure for everything we do, rather than technology as a sector. Okay. It's becoming something that every sector uses as infrastructure. And it's becoming a critical piece of the infrastructure, like without electricity and oil broadly, like without fuel, we almost yeah. can't do anything. Okay. It's becoming embedded in almost everything we do. So right. in that sense, it is becoming kind of the, the bedrock of sorts. Okay. Yeah. And then how can we leverage technology as accelerant or game changers, what we will look at today? And there's a third thing happening, which puts it as a very critical inflection point at this moment in the world. Young people like you all are very, very passionate about positive change. They care a lot about what happens to the world, what happens to people around them. They're demanding the change. So these three things put us at a very, yeah, yeah thanks, David. Sure. Um, so there are two sides to technology. I'm going to jump in. So one of the levers was social entrepreneurship. The other lever we touched on is technology. Technology can, I'm going to jump into a few examples on how it can be a positive game changer. One example is from India. Today we're going to focus on India. So I'm going to talk about a couple of India-focused examples and we'll come back to more. Your Dost is an organization in India. India is a country 
where there is a lot of social taboo about mental health. People don't go to psychologists. But now, this social entrepreneur has managed to solve that problem because leveraging the anonymity of the internet, now she's connecting patients who with care providers they have a personalized relationship, but they keep the anonymity. So this is something that was not possible before. Similarly, I just learned recently that um, there is, um, in, again looking at India, there's technologies whereby satellite imaging, one could just with technology predict what is happening, which areas are more poverty, what is happening with the rate of urban sprawl, all of this just by satellite images and extrapolating from that. So it's fascinating what's happening with technology. On the negative side, we of course live in an age of fake news, misinformation, there is so much confusion, people don't know what to trust. I'll touch on again um, an Asia example, South Asia example, the Rohingya crisis, which is one of the worst refugee crises right now in the world. Partially, some of us believe a key factor has been that a lot of people in that part of the world, Myanmar, have been receiving news mainly from social media, and they've been receiving a lot of negative news which is, uh, or information, which has led to xenophobia against certain ethnic groups, and it's led to one of the biggest uh, humanitarian crises in the world. And this is an example where technology, social media can amplify negative messaging as well. So the questions are that tech has an acceleration uh, is a way of accelerating and being foundational in achieving all the SDGs. How key is its role? The other question is, will the digital divide kind of increase with technology and increase inequality, or will it be an equalizer? Um, if we could, um, Richard, mm -hmm. just. So some of the key factors in achieving the SDGs are high capital needs. The SDG is going to need, the, the capital gap is $2.5 trillion right now. You need a lot of money that's just not there in government aid, UN funding and such. Technology could be a key factor in reducing this gap. The kind of innovations we're talking about could bring down the capital needs. Now this policy change, we need inclusive, integrated, sustainable policy. And this is an area where social entrepreneurs like Rickin, who bring change in how we think, could actually create social movements that influence policy. Again, we need non-linear scalable innovation and tech could be a huge factor there. And then we need to shift how people think. And that again is an area where social entrepreneurs can have a huge influence. We need to look, have systemic change in how we think about each other, about the environment. And then we need deep collaboration across sectors. So I will jump into a few examples and then wrap up. Um, I, I have I have some examples from Africa I won't get into. I'll just touch on the India examples. One example of this kind of systems change where social entrepreneur is leveraging technology very powerfully, but also changing the culture and creating many more social entrepreneurial minded people is Internet Sati. This is a collaborative of um, Google and the Tata Trust in India. It was born as a 20% project of a Google employee. And this is transforming the role of women. What it is doing in, in, in some parts of rural India, there are gender, gender cultural issues where people think that women are not tech savvy. Now this, this kind of initiative is making women the people who bring the internet to the villages. The women are trained on technology and internet access. They bring it to the villages. They train people in the villages. They become the ones who teach their husbands how to have access to good farming techniques. They tell the mother-in-laws how to have good recipes. So suddenly, it's a shift in how women are viewed, and they are viewed as a tech savvy ones. And this initiative has scaled to a large number of, I don't want to get my facts wrong, 15 million women across India are affected by this. And it's in 150,000 villages. Um, and this is really, really catching on like fire. It's a platform on which many other services can be built. And this is an example where digital literacy of women and putting them in the leadership roles, what it can achieve. Now, the example is CG Natswara. Again, it's one where a BBC journalist, social entrepreneur, went to tribal India, the most vulnerable people in India. And he taught them citizen journalism, a few of them in each village, and empowered them with a amazing solution where they don't even have smartphones or basic phones. So all the citizen journalist has to do is audio record what they're seeing in the village, just leave a voicemail. 
via a basic phone. Yeah, and then this happens all over India. And then the next day, these are loaded on the server, and any person living in a tribal indigenous community in any part of India can just dial a number, and they hear what's happening all over. This is transforming what's happening. The voice is getting heard. Not just that, the issues that are arising, human rights issues and such, are being heard by the nation, by various people, and it's transforming their lives. But one common thing in both of these it's not just the social entrepreneurs who started this. They have empowered so many more change makers via technology. And then uh, there's things happening at the national level as well. In India, other ideas transformed what happens to half a billion people. Other ID is a biometrics-based digital ID. It's an amazing experiment in India where now so many Indians who did not have an identity have a legal identity, hence they have access to so many services including like food rations, uh, banking services, even if they are illiterate, they could still do this via biometrics. It's transforming their lives. And um, th another example is in Kenya, where Kenya is looking, the UN and the government are looking to leverage tech innovation to provide universal health care to every Kenyan. And they want to partner with tech providers and doing amazing work there. And then I want to touch on summer source. There's also things happening across countries, across continents. Summer source is a local organization here, which is doing work in India, Africa. It is um, fascinating in that it brings digital micro work, little bits of digital work from places like Silicon Valley to the most vulnerable communities in rural India, in sub-Saharan Africa. It's transforming how, how we are able to engage with each other. All of this is done via the internet. And then finally, I want to touch on Google Oceans, Google Earth. These are global technology innovations. There are global transformations that are happening by mapping the oceans with technology that helps us understand where is deforestation happening. That is enabling global collaboration and transformation. And I just want to wrap up with a call to action. But this is a moment, let's come together as a global community to collaborate, to innovate, to do whatever we can. In the true spirit of social entrepreneurship, you don't need to be a classic social entrepreneur, it's a way of thinking. And let's leverage technology in an intentional, thoughtful, responsible manner to advance these global goals are our goals. They are not the UN's goals, they are not the government leaders, they are each and every world citizen's goals. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Radhika. As I'm setting up the, uh, the next presentation, I'd like to ask, how do you see a definition for social entrepreneurship? That is a very interesting question that I've given a lot of thought to Richard. Okay. Um, because here in Silicon Valley, entrepreneurship is tied to building a successful business and making money. And uh, social entrepreneurship is uh, often thought of as a make money and uh, achieve goals or a non-profit. But to me, again, I, I have some deep connection uh, history with Ashoka. I had uh, started the former Silicon Valley chapter for Ashoka, so this is a topic I discuss with some Ashoka staff, and I, I see social entrepreneurship as a way of um, people who innovate, a way of innovating, a way of tackling some of the biggest challenges, being resourceful, like an entrepreneur is, in the, in the term entrepreneur means kind of resourceful innovator. It doesn't have anything to do with making money. It's, that is one way of scaling the other ways, and it doesn't matter if you're a non-profit or a for-profit, that's just legal structure. Someone who kind of looks at big challenges and cares about mission and, so and jumps in in an innovating good, manner. But let me push it a little further. Yes. How's that different from philanthropy? It's different because in philanthropy, you come in with the mindset of what can I fund? Right. Mm -hmm. And okay. here, your, the money is... It's what it, can I change. What can I change, yeah? yeah? Not what can I fund. What problem can I tackle? Mm -hmm. And what can I change? Whether you're changing a norm, whether you're changing a system in some manner. Money is just a resource. Okay. So let's move on, and we may come back to this kind of topic. But Rikin, um, I'll do your slides, okay? So <laughs> just tell me what to do. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thank you so much, Professor Professor Dasher, to have me, uh, Radhika, as well, for organizing. It's great to be with all of you guys. Fifteen years ago, I would never think that I would be on such a panel. Fifteen years ago, I was here visiting Stanford uh, to potentially come here for grad school in aerospace engineering uh, with because I had dreams of, of going to space. I didn't come here. I went to MIT. Uh, but I was sort of wanting to, to put together my own astronaut playbook by studying computer science, aerospace engineering, getting a pilot license, 
and was about to enlist in the U.S. Air Force when, next slide, <laughs> I landed up in a very different place with a very different type of hero. Right, what, what really inspired me about astronauts was with their unique combination of brains and brawn to make like what seemed impossible, possible. And what I landed up in was rural India back in 2006 with some friends from college who were trying to start up a biodiesel venture uh, with some farming communities in rural Maharashtra, essentially to convince them to grow oil-bearing crops that could be esterified into biodiesel. And what was interesting was this community of farmers are really small farmers. These are farmers that just have half an acre to an acre worth of land, earn just one to two dollars per day, but in totality are pr producing the second highest farm output in the world. And the way that they do that is the fact that 60% of India's 1.2 uh, billion population depends still on agriculture as a major source of its livelihoods. And about 80% of these farmers are small farmers. And the market potential is huge, right? They're producing about $118 billion worth of uh, production. And most of this production is just being sold in informal marketplaces in a pretty uh, ad hoc manner. So what we started off with was back in 2006, initially as a part of Microsoft Research, I joined forces with them after this startup venture kind of flopped after six months because basically it didn't make sense for farmers to convert their land from food crops to oil bearing crops when they still needed food to be eaten for themselves. Uh, and so then I joined up with Microsoft Research in Bangalore uh, in a group looking at technology for emerging markets, which had a mandate to think about, is there a role of technology in different areas of development, from microfinance to education to healthcare, and in our case, agriculture? And what we wanted to see is, is there a role for technology in the broadest possible sense? Thinking about like even the pen and paper as being a form of technology, all the way to, say, a tablet computer. And what ended up uh, us landing on was the use of videos. Videos that would be produced by farmers, for farmers, to share best agricultural practices with each other. Very similar to, say, the YouTube experience, where all of us generally gravitate to our own niche communities uh, online. Similarly, trying to recreate that atmosphere in an asynchronous way, where videos would be produced offline just using camcorders, would be stored on a kind of a repository online, including on YouTube, and then be available offline on mobile projectors that could be screened amongst local communities, uh, and where data and feedback could be captured about what videos farmers were watching, what practices they ultimately did, and what practice, what questions or issues they might have had afterwards. So can I ask, yeah. was this because of worry that older generations were dying off and younger generations weren't starting, or was this really because not many farmers were really using best practices. Yeah, the, the, basically the latter. And, okay. and it's a huge business of trying to train farmers on ways to boost their productivity, especially in the face of like climate change yeah. and market sort of uh, you know change. And and the government of India, for instance, has one of the largest extension forces in the world, which is basically the adult education of farmers. They have about 200,000 odd individuals who just go around to farmers' fields to demonstrate, here's a new seed variety, here's a fertilizer, here's how you connect with markets. And they do this all through face-to-face -face means. And this use of videos was essentially meant to complement the work that they were already doing and to essentially improve their efficiency. And we ran some randomized control trials where we found that this approach could basically save these extension programs of, say, the government, uh, basically one-tenth of their cost to get one more farmer to adopt one new practice using these videos. Okay. So, so far, we've scaled this approach now to about one and a half million farmers across 17,000 villages, uh, largely across South Asia, but also into parts of Africa, including like in Ethiopia and the rest. What we do is we, do, we partner with mostly local government, like Ministry of Rural Development in India has a large-scale program of training farmers, and they use these videos, again, by farmers for farmers, to ex improve the, their efficiency. 
Um, and similarly, in Ethiopia, we work with the Ministry of Agriculture and, and do something very similar. But so that's what we started with. And we were doing that basically from 2006 to basically about two years ago. We were seeing ourselves as this video-based enabler, essentially like a YouTube for these farmers and for these extension programs that were trying to train these farmers on ways to boost their production. But what we realized was that information alone isn't going to create the final net income benefit that these farmers ultimately need to see in their pockets. What we found is, in fact, through our randomized control trials, was that this approach was, was creating this 10x improvement in efficiency and was resulting in gains of, of, uh, of income of about 21%. But this was not sufficiently transformative for these farmers to really be like, hey, maybe I don't want to be a farmer anymore. Maybe I want to graduate. Well, how is that going to happen? Well, you got to do stuff beyond information. And you got to go beyond just the production part of agriculture and think about those next tops that are before production of how do I access seeds and fertilizers and the next top about how I access output markets to actually take my produce, sell it at market, and get more money for it. So the way that farmers generally do that in terms of the, the latter thing of how do I take, say I boosted my production by getting access to amazing information, whether in video or non-video form, like how do I go to market? Well, for perishable uh, produce, like fruits and vegetables, farmers in India have just a couple of options. Either they can sell the top 10% of their produce in their local community and they'll get a great price for it. They can sit on the roadside and try to sell like some small quantities of produce, or they can take a bus, a bicycle, or maybe a fellow person's like motorbike to the nearby wholesale market, which is called a mandi in India. And, and usually those markets are just about like five to 20 kilometers in distance from these farmers, but it costs money. It costs them generally about uh, 45% of the value of their produce just on transportation and seven to eight hours worth of time, right? And so, and for a perishable commodity so like fruits and vegetables, it's a race against time. Either you get your produce to market and you get it sold or it's worthless by the same day. So what we ended up creating was a service that we call Loop, which you can think of as essentially an Uber pool for fruits and vegetables. Essentially, farmers request pickups for their fruit and vegetable harvest. We match that to nearby transporters in the local vicinity, everything from a small rickshaw to a one to two ton truck that is then assigned to go follow a route, make the pickups from these farmers' doorsteps, move the produce to wholesale markets, and complete the sale of this produce and pay them back via mobile money. There's now a service in India called Paytm that is very popular. Uh, for these farmers to get same day payments. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. And what we're in now in the process of doing is essentially taking what began as a nonprofit initiative from 2006 to 2016 <laughs> to now in the process of saying that, you know, these farmers did need that basic boost in production. And in some ways, we actually were successful at massive scale of about one and a half million farmers. But now these farmers' needs have changed. They're transforming, just like the economy of India is changing. There's so much more demand from the middle class and these rural communities for this fruit and vegetable produce that farming no longer needs to be seen as like a vocation of subsistence but can actually be something that is a commercially viable business for them and for us. And so we're becoming a, a social enterprise by essentially converting this loop service into a for-profit where basically farmers pay for, the, for their share of the transportation and the pot buyers also pay because we're giving them consistently higher volumes of the produce that they need. And so certainly we are a social enterprise in the definition that we are not profitable <laughs> at the moment, and that's why we're kind of in the red. Uh, but uh, we anticipate that we will be uh, in the next two years uh, by basically hitting around $151 million of annual sales of taking this farmer's produce to market with just even 400,000 farmers' 
uh, produce. So far, what we've reached is about 25,000 farmers and have uh, converted about tw $12 million worth of produce. So we're kind of already on this journey. Um, and next slide. What we're essentially trying to, to do is to see, can we reimagine the way that people think about agricultural development and supply chain development? Generally, if you're a Starbucks or you're a Cargill type of agricultural company that's sourcing some commodity, you start from yourself as the buyer and then you source from catchment areas of, of farmers who can supply to you. What we're trying to say is, can we do this in reverse? Can we make it as efficient as possible for these farmers to connect with first hop markets and then connect them with first these local wholesale markets and then these bigger buyers so that these farmers can then be connected to this global agricultural and food system that we are all part of. And, and that's what we think is, is our ultimate impact. That's, that's all. Okay, <laughs> did you want to show the video? Oh yes, this is a short video, only uh, 55 seconds, uh, that you know, will give you just a kind of a sense of how the loop service uh, works. It's really basic, <laughs> right, as I described. Uh, it's, you know, the first step is essentially that these farmers are almost on an every other day basis are harvesting produce. They then like make these pickup requests that I have so much, so many bags of produce. We assign a truck to make the pickups. They load the produce onto a shared vehicle, reduces the amortized costs for each of them. The produce goes to wholesale markets. It's sold for money. That money is then digitized via Paytm, and then the money then shows back into the accounts of these farmers. And that's it. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm curious, how did things work before you brought in Loop? There were middlemen, right, who would do the delivery and so forth. And in fact, my understanding is that in many places in Southeast Asia, they're kind of taking most of the money and the farmers don't get anything. Yeah, so, so, so in the case of the fruit and vegetable marketplace, actually there's not too many um, middlemen because the volumes are very small. You're a half acre farmer who is growing like say squash or eggplant. Essentially you're harvesting maybe 30 to 100 kilos of this produce every other day in season. Now that is not attractive for even a middleman <laughs> to like come and help, help pick mm -hmm. and steal stuff from you. It's like nothing. <laughs> and so for like the farmers, actually for them, it's actually a decision of, is it worth it for me to go to the Monday to spend usually about like maybe, you know, 50 cents, like 30, 40 rupees to get like maybe $5 worth of value for my produce. So oftentimes it's not. Uh, they'll just like let the stuff like rot in their fields. And so what are we doing? Well, we, you know, when it, when it, we're, we're basically making it efficient so that even if you have like that micro quantity of produce, hey, we can bundle that all together. Even if you're a big guy or you're a super small guy, everyone gains by sharing like a truckload and mm -hmm. your amortized costs yeah. kind of going down. Okay, <laughs> so this new service should become profitable. Yep. Right now, you're going to keep Digital Green as a nonprofit organization, and then are you creating creating a new legal entity for the for-profit side? Yeah, that's right. So, so basically, we do think that there still remains an uh, unmet need from a public good perspective to help farmers just boost their production, yeah. and we think that is something that the government needs to invest in, and even we do with like our video peer-to-peer -peer sharing work. But yeah, this loop service, like it has to be competitive to existing other options that mm -hmm. farmers have to like whether they're taking a bus or a motorbike, like we're saying that our amortized cost is lesser and more efficient than those other options. So yeah, we got to like beat them <laughs> uh, in, in a commercial way. So I'm curious, will you set it up as a regular for-profit company or are you going to do something use one of these new social impact <laughs> enterprise, social enterprise B corporation, right? No, we, yeah, right now we're not trying to do all that complexity because this is also going to be a, you know, an Indian enterprise, okay. <laughs> right? And okay. so India does not have all these kinds of um, variations to like corporations or even nonprofits. And actually that has been a limitation for us, which is uh, we are registered as a 
is a nonprofit in India, mm -hmm. and nonprofits in India cannot be doing this kind of work yeah. <laughs> because even like even if we're not earning money, you can't be like fundamentally be like your nature of business can't be helping can't people be doing access a market business activity. <laughs> exactly. Yes, right. <laughs> Okay, yeah. <laughs> so that's great. Um, I want to jump and, and kind of ask a question. First of all, to Radhika, who is using the Sustainable Development Goals? I mean, they're so big, they're so broad, they're understandable by everybody, mm -hmm. but that means that they're not exactly narrowly defined enough to be considered business models. Yeah, I think uh, many people, they're designed in a manner that everyone can use them. Uh -huh. While they're very broad and ambitious, there's also sub-goals that are fairly detailed. Not just that, there are targets and indicators where you can even look at how to measure a sub-goal. Okay. In terms of who's using, it's new, but there is in the philanthropy sector, I myself am an advisor where a lot of the philanthropic organizations have come together at the SDG philanthropy mm -hmm. platform mm -hmm. to collaborate on the business side. There is uh, Impact 2030, which Google, uh, Ritz Carlton, and others have started a consortium where um, corporates have come together to get the employees to volunteer at a whole different level with the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals. So in a sense, it's a taxonomy that leaders in almost every sector are starting to use. Of course, the UN is restructuring almost everything around these goals. Mm -hmm. Then I'll give an example of governments as well. All governments have committed, but coming back to India, the Indian government is, uh, the, the planning um, organization of the Indian government is, Niti Aayog is now completely repurposed to do things around the SDGs. And the state of Assam in India is also redoing everything around these goals. SDGs is the acronym for the goals. So much so that I believe when a government employee puts in an expense report, if they don't say which goal it fits under, they won't get reimbursed. So. I no. <laughs> have to specify which one. Yeah, okay. Exactly. So I think I myself, I'll give you an example right here. At our group, Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs, uh, which is people from the tech um, world of Silicon Valley, Stanford, we are starting to look at, in terms of how can we bring the power of technology to help society, we are doing a lot of talks and activity around using the, the SDGs as a framework for where we want to engage. The other thing is doing, um, Richard, is that people can collaborate. So now, if you and Kenya wants to work on health, I can say who else is working on SDG 3? And, and people are using that language, and so it's becoming a protocol as well for global collaboration. It really, and, and really helps the kind of discussion, provides new platforms for yeah. collaboration and so forth. Okay, uh, for both of you, it all has always impressed me that South Asia has been very aware of social problems uh -huh. and that social entrepreneurship in some ways has moved further, faster there than most other places in Asia. And why? <laughs> why is this? Because, uh, you know, as a developing economy, India certainly has big issues with, you know, poverty and with hunger and so forth, but so do lots of other places. And I've always been curious, why do you think South Asia has really picked up on these as a, as a major motivation for a lot of activity? I could uh, jump in with my hypothesis. Uh, for me, I grew up in the backdrop of the Gandhi ashram, very steeped in Gandhian philosophy, and also having read Gandhi a lot, my sense is that that is a key, he was a father of a nation in a sense, and the, when India was born. People were following him today, still many are, and he really, it wasn't just that he got India independence. For him, it was all about the dignity of the individual mm -hmm. and dignity from self-reliance, and that dignity comes from being self-employed. And Khadi, the symbol, the kind of Gan Gandhi started a social movement that start using Khadi. Khadi is a fabric, which is a symbol of every rural Indian come up with a simple view. They could spin cloth at home. Anyone can do it. And then he started a movement where it, it was a call to action to all Indians to only use Khadi. Part of it was boycotting British fabric, but part of it was be self-reliant and let's all help each other. Be entrepreneurial. Everyone who spun a gun, uh, Khadi wheel um, at home, every villager was a social entrepreneur okay. in a sense. So that spirit has been there. And I okay. think that is, that is probably one of the factors. I don't have a sense for why it's that way in other parts of South Asia, so okay. I won't speculate. Okay. Rikin, you might comment on that or maybe from your own perspective of having started out in regular, you know, 
IT computer companies, right, mm. um, moving into social entrepreneurship later. Well, yeah, I mean, I think like so the the reason why um, you know Microsoft Research created this group, Technology for Emerging Markets in mm -hmm. India, was because you know basically they were like, there's obviously Microsoft Research labs all around the world. They study like typical areas of computer science, but because of like the unique place and context that India represents of people who are not using technology in the way that we are in the West, that's why they set up this kind of like academic group. And I had no aspirations of becoming a social entrepreneur <laughs> until like it just kind of like uh, transpired. But I, I think um, there's a couple of things I would say. One is I definitely echo like Radhika's point, you know, Gandhi's famous quote, you know, be, be the change you want to see in the world, right? Like the whole Ashoka, <laughs> social entrepreneurship, even name, kind of its origins are, are actually from India. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this, the second is um, this kind of like n notion of like Jugad innovation that, that is known in India. Right, where everyone is is actually just in their own way, whether just they're just like at a home or they're like in a workplace or something, is just trying to figure out how I can like amalgamate some combination of things to like so work for Jugad me. So, Jugad <laughs> innovation is an interesting term. Can yeah. you explain that a little? It's more? basically like the more like an emergent or non-formal, <laughs> least structured process yeah. of of making things work. Yeah. <laughs> right to the extent that you can. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do also with, uh, you know, the, the context, right, of like the type of governance structure that exists in India, right, like the largest democracy in the world. Uh, the fact that it is also like super large <laughs> with such a density of population. You know, some initiatives, like even our loop service, right, right? like w don't actually make sense in other context like they don't make sense in like say a low density but still like poverty stricken place like say Niger why because like the context is one where there's such a low density of people sure they're very very poor and they have a lot of need but they're like low density of population low access to like transportation and like connectivity kinds of constraints but that's what's cool about India is like you got like this population density where a lot of things kind of like make sense and works at like this perfect storm with all this like technology and like English and at least like communications that are on the internet that a language that is available on the internet for people to kind of come onto a common platform that is spurring like such a revolution in startup ecosystem in India, right? You know, you probably have heard about like the whole like Walmart Flipkart deal that just kind of took place <laughs> a couple of days ago. Um, Sixteen billion dollars. Sixteen for billion dollars, yeah, because Walmart's like saturated here, and and <laughs> and so this is like the only last big market for them, and so yeah, I, I mean, I encourage everyone <laughs> who is interested. Uh, to immerse yourself like in a place like India, mm -hmm. that's the only way that you can actually innovate, not to do it like from afar. <laughs> um, okay. May I add one? Yeah. Sure, I please do. I think because uh, I'm also um, part of a group called Rajiv Circle and um, social entrepreneurs from there come here every year, <laughs> fellows from Pakistan and India. And I often wonder they're so doing amazing things on such low resources compared to entrepreneurs here. And uh, I think one factor might be that when resources are very limited, you innovate and you're way more resourceful. And that is part of being an entrepreneur as well. That's true. Actually, that's been one of my main interests in this part of the world. I remember touring around some of the product development groups and the IITs. Mm -hmm. And people who were coming up with really clever solutions that nobody here would have thought of. Mm -hmm. The idea from here is to try to take something expensive and make it cheaper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But from there, you start from yeah. frugal innovation, right? Yeah. Um, let's open the floor. Before, well, okay, Walter, you go first. How does the social entrepreneurship affect the livelihood of the lowest class in India? How, uh, okay. How does, how does social entrepreneurship affect the lowest? And, and I'm not sure if caste is intentional, but, you know, yes, group of people. It is, yeah. Okay. I, I, and, uh, you want, you can go. Okay. <laughs> I'll give an example of, uh, of another Ashoka fellow. 
um, Anshu, um, who, who has uh, started an organization called Gunj. I'll give a specific example to answer your question. In villages um, right now in India, the caste system is still there quite a bit. And the most economically underprivileged are the people in the lowest caste. And often they're not able to come out of that cycle of poverty and societal kind of suppression. But what this social entrepreneur has done is he brings, you innovate, right? In amazing ways, he brings, uh, he has uh, urban Indians kind of uh, share their, the clothes and um, other things that they're not using, bring them to a distribution center, which is an amazing distribution center all over the big cities in India. He tells them that you're not doing a favor to um, rural Indians. We are helping you, we're helping you be sustainable. So they're doing you a favor. Then he brings those clothes and other goods to rural India. And then he says, in the village, the people who are willing to do community projects, help your community, get these things. In the villages, the remote villages, these things are precious, even old clothes, old computers. And what he's doing, he doesn't go to the power system, the, the panchayat system, which is often upper caste. Often the lowest caste people come in, they need these things the most, and he empowers them, and then they go and do the community projects. They have the best clothes. Suddenly the status changes, then others come in. This is one example. Another example is Internet Sati, when I mentioned, is often the women from many different castes who come in, and uh, they teach people how to use the Internet. It's not just upper caste women. It changes the status. So I think social entrepreneurs really, really challenge the norm, the cultural norms particularly, including the caste norm. And I'm sure Rickon has uh, thoughts on what yeah, is happening. Yeah, I mean, I think it is an interesting point. Sometimes, like, technology can sort of create um, or exacerbate even, like, the asymmetries uh, that exist, right, in society, as Radhika said, right, uh, including for, like, caste and gender. You know, for instance, in general, access to, like, mobile phones by, like, women is, like, less than 50% than their male counterparts. Um, but, like, programs, <laughs> like this Internet Sati type one, uh, are trying to, like, engage, like, women so that they have, like, more ownership and have more applications that are of relevance and, you know, are sensitive to, like, how their use cases. Uh, similarly for us, right, like, one in our transportation service, like, one cultural barrier that exists is actually for women that they, they can, women can go and buy at marketplaces, but they typically cannot sell at wholesale markets. And so actually what does the transportation do? It allows like the far women farmers who are increasingly more prevalent because like the male counterparts have migrated to like the cities to do like construction work. Now they have a way <laughs> to like have their produce basically like picked up and, and sold uh, for them. <laughs> and I think kind of behind what the, you both say is any kind of an entrepreneurial idea has to take the market, for lack of a better word, right, the users, mm -hmm. where they are and mm -hmm. help them move to the next step that they can move to. Mm -hmm. And so it's a process where it happens in different steps, not all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One thing doesn't solve the whole problem. No, Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was wondering, when you were talking about Luke, what do you see as the bottleneck for growth? It sounds like, you know, it sounds perfectly reasonable in your presentation, um, but what's like what's having you not grow as fast uh, as you would like? So the biggest one is the trust factor, right? Farmers to be trusting that I can load my bag of produce onto this truck and that it will be fine <laughs> and it will go to like the marketplace and I will get back fair value for it. Right? It's a kind of big behavior change. So they don't get the money until the actual sale happens in the market? That's right. We take no, we, we take no such liability of guaranteeing prices or any mm. such thing. Uh, so, but the way that we kind of establish this trust, essentially, is that farmers are welcome <laughs> to go on the truck if they want. And sometimes they do, especially in the beginning. Um, and then secondly, we also push back the prices, that, the clearing prices that, that have taken place at market. Uh, so that they can kind of corroborate that with other informal challenge channels that they're anyway speaking like with their friends and others to be like, oh yeah, this was the prevailing market price. And did Loop give me that? Like, if yes, like, I'm happy. If not, like, I'm going to have questions. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. One is, um, like, the, have, a lot of bargaining happens in the Monday, right? 
So the farmer goes and he'll give his produce and surely the wholesaler will say, oh, it's bad produce, it's, you know, part of it is spoiled or rotten, I'll give you only this price. So who bargains on behalf of the farmer? Basically, we there we. So let, let me restate real quickly because it's not show. The question doesn't show up on the video. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so, who bargains on behalf of the farmers when the produce gets to market? Great. Um, so, basically, the the bargaining is limited. There's almost like none. Uh, there is some monitoring uh, that our team actually does, like kind of at the marketplace, just to like spot check that. Yeah, we are actually giving these farmers like the prevailing market price. Uh, but other than that, the, the reality is these, you know, again, the fruits and vegetables space is a little bit different than the grains marketplace. And with fruits and vegetables, uh, it's not like uh, a, a typical like auction that's happening. No, it's like basically you just go to like some commission agent and uh, that guy, you know, basically is going to like sort away the produce, sort and grade away the produce, and then he will determine, you know, what is the cost of the price points for each. And the way that that guy sets his price is actually not by himself. He's a commission agent. <laughs> so the, it, the actually, it's the next top. It's the trader above him who is actually setting this price. Um, in any case, like what we found is that the fact that there ends up being variable prices for farmers is actually a good thing. Why? Because like for f farmers, it gives them a direct signal that, oh, this produce was of good quality, maybe my buddy, and he got a good price. And mine, I didn't store properly, and so I got a worse price. And so it, it changes their behavior over time to like do the right thing <laughs> that the market actually wants in terms of their produce. I have kind of a different follow-up <laughs> question, and that is, the technology that's kind of behind uh, what you're doing with Loop. Yeah. Why couldn't this have happened five years ago, or you know? Yeah, it, it, it could have been. It would have been like way harder to scale, <laughs> right? To like the the point from Tony. Is it the pay TM? Uh, there's a couple of things yeah. I would say. Like one is this more like automated brokerage, right? Between like the farmers to the transporters. Right, an allocation of who should be routed to assign to what pickup. The payments thing, certainly yes. And then there's a third thing, which I didn't actually talk about, which is um, we basically are able to capture a ton of transactional data, right? Because every day, you know, these 25,000 farmers, some subset of them are using Loop to like transact. And so we then get a lot of data about like, okay, what was the local wholesale market prices that commodities cleared? in different marketplaces and what was the cost to get there. And so it basically helps to like recommend sort of price arbitrage opportunities for these farmers to be like, should I go to the, you know, the wholesale market five kilometers to my east or five kilometers to my south? They oftentimes they don't know that. Like yeah. sort of like trade-off. And it's like pretty simple. It's only like within the five kilometer radius. Uh, but it's only because we have this actual transactional sales data that we can actually uh, do that kind of curation. And on the, the uh, pickup side, the routing side, is that proprietary software that you're using, or how did you develop that? Uh, yeah, so it is proprietary. I would say it's not as sophisticated <laughs> um, okay. as, like, as Uber, right? Because like Uber is certainly doing like all this like GPS like location by location like tracking and minute by minute, <laughs> right? Like pricing. Uh, transporters in India are at least the transporters we work with. We work with about 850 of them. Uh, they are not yet accustomed to that kind of level of scrutiny. <laughs> and so the way that this routing, routing happens is mostly at a village to village and market level. So it's like you go to this village first and that village next and that market okay. fourth. <laughs> right. Okay. Great. Thanks. <laughs> right. um, these, are, these are great comments. Thank you. I, I, I love this topic. Radhika, uh, uh, you started off by talking about the global leaders who are all looking at these uh, SDGs and sort of buying off on them. And I'm always a little skeptical when I hear stuff like that, probably for understandable reasons. Uh, but something you said actually really struck me when you talked about how the um, nonprofits aren't allowed to do this type of work. And it, it got me thinking, to what extent are those government leaders thinking about the fact that maybe some of the things they need to change are the rules of the game in order to allow these things to work more effectively and more efficiently and enable social entrepreneurship, as opposed to saying, hey, we support this, or we want to throw money at it, or we want to, whatever they might be doing, looking at it as a program, 
what extent do they actually step back and say, you know what, we actually need to change something about the way we do things here from a legal system, from a, from a structural system, in order to make this work better? So briefly for the video, <laughs> yeah, <sorry>. uh, have <laughs> the SDGs led to governments looking at regulatory frameworks to try to improve the ability of the frameworks to deal with social entrepreneurship? Me too. Okay, so I, I think, I mean, of course, uh, I agree that governments are not the ones who are very good at changing the rules of the game, but it's a baby step. I think what, what this is doing is people like us can now be at the table, people like Rickin, and because of the framework of the goals, I again answer your question with an example. In the state of Jharkhand in India, which is where there's a lot of indigenous communities, the Forest Rights Act is the the act that kind of determines who gets land rights, the companies who operate there, the government, the indigenous communities. As is being rewritten, our SDG philanthropy platform, we are able to have a seat at the table now by because we're looking at the SDGs and coming with that lens, and the government is looking at the SDGs. We have been able to get a seat at the table. Um, by we, I mean uh, UN representatives and country. And not just that, we're able to say that all of we're looking at who owns what, how much, but uh, women are not in the picture. If women, indigenous women, also had some land rights, it would not just help. It's not just a good thing to do. It would be better for the community. They might actually be more collaborative, and we're able to bring those kind of policy tweaks. Now, it's a baby step. But I think that's where the rules of the game change is going to come from, that now governments are inviting other stakeholders as they're thinking on SDG 3, SDG 5, who are the players. That said, it's very early days. And uh, that on the, on the legal framework, again, I think it's a global linkage. There's a lot happening in this country right now around non-profits versus for-profits, looking at new forms of legal charters for mission. There's a lot happening in England. And uh, around SDGs, people might collaborate on this is the hope. Mm. You had mentioned in your presentation that there's this kind of capital gap of about $2.5 trillion that's needed in order to address the SDGs. I had also seen separately a report by a business group looking at business opportunities that are resulting from the SDGs mm -hmm. um, that was a huge amount of money. I think it was mm -hmm. something like in the neighborhood of somewhere in the tens of trillions of dollars I remember that the amount they expected China could benefit by addressing SDGs was like 5.5 trillion and India was maybe 2.5 trillion dollars that could be added to the economy mm -hmm. by, you know, aggressively attacking these goals. Um, where's the money going to come from? Well, it, it is an ambitious goal, but I think you're, you're touching on the, absolutely the point that I, I think all of us in the space recognize that if the private sector is not at the table, there just isn't enough money, not with all the philanthropies, UN government aid put together. And so it is that moment to look at, I believe, the tremendous business opportunities here. And uh, the country of Kenya, for example, the UN is welcoming private sector, big global companies to come to the table. They want to achieve universal health care. They're saying, come here, work with us. We'll design policy to make it um, business lucrative for you. But let's all look at the goal of solving health care. And that said, there's also an opportunity to reframe a bit things up. People are in healthcare, people are already in education, people are in the food industry. So the SDGs also offer an opportunity to look at things with a different lens. But the key thing is, I think, where are the business cases for achieving the SDGs yeah. and engaging private sector? And the other change, I think, is from within to the degree some of the big companies are starting to think about these goals and kind of thinking, bringing it into the core mission, not just CSR groups. Yeah. That is another factor that's going to affect things in countries like India. India has a 2% CSR law that every, every corporate is required to give 2%. Now many of those are looking at, can we do yeah. things, this around the SDGs and bring it into the core mission mm -hmm. of the company? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's one of these things where you do see the role of government and then the role of industry, and there's this nice overlap yeah. space provided there's not a gap. Yes. Are you concerned that the governments are not going to support the framework needed for doing good entrepreneurship? I mean, and this is one of those things where entrepreneurs say we're changing the world for the better, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of people have this kind of attitude that business is just there to make money and somehow 
in that space, you have to have a really good social impact business mindset, right? Yes. Are you concerned that these two might not overlap so well? I am cautiously concerned. I'm also an optimist. I'm an uber <laughs> optimist. So I, I feel that the SDGs can catalyze. They're a call to action to governments, to the private sector, to everybody, every world citizen, every organization to find that kind of collaboration okay. and come together to achieve these. But that's where I think people like Rick and the social entrepreneurs of this world mm -hmm. can bring that spirit to everybody and every organization. I think people are coming in with, for the most part, the right mindset and they want to do this. I'm more concerned about will they be able to achieve this because it's non-trivial even with the right yeah, intentionality. Right. So that that is a challenge. But I think we cannot afford to not aim to achieve this, considering how bad the crisis is in the world right yeah. now. Okay. Rick, and what's in the future for Digital Green? <laughs> so you've got the Loot project. There's an awful lot of scaling you can do with that. That's going, that could become huge, right? Mm -hmm. But is Digital Green going to continue to look for new kinds of innovation? What's, what, what do you see as the future for your organization? Yeah, I mean, I think we think about like our work kind of in like sort of like how technology people think about like stacking different layers of mm -hmm. intervention one on top of the other like so our base layer is like these videos produced and buy and for farmers to like boost production we now like have this like loop thing that is like to efficiently connect with first top markets we hope to like be able to stack on top of that is i think mainly two things one is um basically like a uh, a futures market type of play for farmers, right? To, to basically pre-plan their production as per market demand. Because even, it, like, there's one downside to our whole approach, right? <laughs> for like the loop uh, service, which is if we're super successful, we may bite ourselves with the fact that we've now made it super efficient to crash market prices, right? Because we've been able to like increase supply to them. Um, so that's not good. So we definitely need to like be thinking about how you, we might be able to like, in advance of the season, help farmers figure out like, should I grow carrots versus tomatoes versus cauliflower and in what quantities, given that probably there's some market for carrots, but it's like not probably as big as like onions and tomatoes. <laughs> and so we need to like, be distributing sort of like okay. the effort. Okay. So that's where we're, where we're headed. <laughs> Open the floor. Go ahead. Um, on the previous discussion about enablers, um, economic enablers, and the government role in private sector, is there a role for um, like the World Bank to be a banker for you know, these type of, of activities and, and making it a little bit more of a venture capital type of model? So, so what is the role of? international institutions like the World Bank? I think there's definitely a role. But again, I think it's going to have to be things different than the way they've been done. And looking, there's, there's so many things happening with different green and blue bonds, a lot of innovation happening in how we finance some of this work and uh, development finance as well. And I think the key thing is every the important thing here is going to be that every actor comes to the table with some humility and recognizing none of us know the answers because we have complex challenges. How can we all together figure out what needs to be done? And this, I think, is particularly the point that was made about governments, World Bank, UN. It's particularly important that these organizations also look at how social entrepreneurs are doing things and bring some of that spirit into the organizations is going to be very important. That said, those roles are very important because we need to scale and we need to scale fast. And the UN, the World Bank, I'm a believer also the big organizations can have huge impact, but we need to do things differently than the way we've been doing them, that I'm convinced. How do you convince them to do that? I think by bringing them together <laughs> in a room and discussions, okay. right? And uh, that okay. I think it's by collaboration and having people in round tables. Okay. That's why we do this SDG philanthropy platform where we have yeah. UN government philanthropy, but we need a lot more like that. And we need people like <laughs> Rick in, on podiums like this talking about how they do things. And Rick, and you had a comment on this? I was just going to say, yeah. you know, I was. Um, so I was at an event in the state of Andhra Pradesh where Bill Gates and the chief minister of Andhra Pradesh, uh, Naidu, were there. And basically what, what the chief minister was basically talking about was how 20 years ago he worked with Bill Gates to like introduce the IT industry to Hyderabad. 
by setting up basically Microsoft India. And, and that spurred like a crazy ecosystem that we all now know. <laughs> um, and now what they're talking about is, can we do the same for like say a new field, like our field of like ag tech? So basically, can we do AT for IT was kind of their whole thing. But one thing I wanted to say was that I think there are, there are inherent tensions on like all these things which are like sometimes hard to reconcile, right? And the one that, that you know, I guess we've seen like firsthand, which is uh, rural communities are a major constituency for politicians, right? So they do want to protect their interests and everyone, we, we also want to protect their interests, right? <laughs> but on the other hand, uh, sometimes that goes far, right? <laughs> which is like maybe they're going to like limit something like foreign direct investment in a sector like agriculture because they think that some corporation is going to harm farmers, right? Which is their constituency. So how do you reconcile those two like kind of competing interests of like FDI may be necessary to like boost like investment into a, into a sector that really needs it. On the other hand, like you want to do it in a way that's not harmful to like the people who are obviously at like a low like kind of like purchasing power base. That actually <laughs> kind of brings up a point in um, theories of innovation <laughs> that there is a way of looking at innovation that it always creates a class of winners and a class of losers. <laughs> you know, they're the people who move ahead and they're the people who are left behind. <laughs> and this is an area where um, I've run into people at, at international conferences who are pretty much anti-innovation <laughs> because it's bad for the common people. <laughs> Um, how do you include the common people? I mean, of course, the farmers are doing well, right. but how do you make sure that these projects have kind of an inclusive approach to benefit as many people as possible? I guess that's mm -hmm. first to you, Yeah, yeah I, again, I think the sustainable development goals provide us that framework. And one of the spirit codified in the goals is leave no one behind. Yeah. So if you, when you innovate, you're innovating to a purpose. If you start with innovation where one of the non-negotiables are that we don't want to leave anyone behind, then we get that automatically. And I think we need innovation of a different sort mm -hmm. right now, not the kind that Silicon Valley innovation to make more money for the elite, but innovation that is there to tackle the SDGs. And to that, um, one of our professors here, Professor Banny Banerjee, has a very interesting um, way of doing mm -hmm. this, he calls it systems acupuncture. Look at where are the areas and opportunities to achieve the SDGs and level the playing field for all. And then think of nonlinear innovation in those areas. And if we, if we design innovation that way, I think um, it can be a, actually a game changer in helping have more equality rather than the other way around. Okay. Hmm. Do you have to worry about big agribusiness in uh, what <laughs> you're doing, or are they just not in the picture right now? Uh, certainly, there, we've been approached by big agribusiness, but uh, we've mostly stayed away, <laughs> mainly because big agribusiness typically <laughs> is like interested in just kind of like selling more of their product. Yeah. I've got some seed, I've got some fertilizer, and I want to distribute it. So that's not like our mission, <laughs> it's not really to like help other people sell more product. Um, and like there's, we also have like a little bit of like a kind of a theory of change, which is sure, eventually farmers do need to like probably buy particular things that can like improve their productivity, but that's not step one. <laughs> step one is boost production, boost income by connecting with market, then invest, <laughs> right? In buying, but that's, like invest. <laughs> that really is different than the yeah. typical business's mentality. Right. <laughs> and this is, you know, kind of an exciting good approach to innovation. Mm -hmm. um, okay, time for another few questions. I see several hands. You go first and then you, okay? Um, I have a question about you. Um, have you thought about potentially integrating um, autonomous vehicles to maybe solve that trust and efficiency issue you were talking about? So in the future, autonomous vehicles for loot that would might help the trust issue? Yeah, I think... Um, so, so the the farmers aren't like not just trusting, not trusting the the trucker. They're also not not trusting the the guy at the market, right, where the produce is sold. So, I think one there's fundamental challenges with regard to like the introduction of autonomous vehicles, whether aerial or ground based, in like an environment like rural India, 
for like the kind of volumes or you're dealing with like bulky stuff, right? Like cauliflower, right? In like a one ton quantity. So like aerial stuff is kind of out. Now you're like on ground and yeah, your options of navigation are pretty poor in these rural environments that, you know, although like road connectivity has really been increasing across India, it still is, it still would be a super big challenge to like figure out like, can you do that well? And then secondly, fundamentally, I think it's, I don't think it addresses the, the trust issue necessarily. There were two hands <laughs> over here, okay. Behind you was first, okay. Go ahead. Um, Rick, you, you mentioned protectionism uh, in India a little bit. There's also like a lot of corruption, slimy politicians. I'm sure there's a fruits and vegetable mafia that's going to want to cut up the profits of loot. Uh, it, it would be great if you could speak a little bit to the unique kind of challenges of India, doing business in India, and, and kind of how do you not let that be a deterrent as you're working? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so, you know, like our core, like kind of like the video nonprofit kind of like work that we've been doing for like, you know, 11 years. Uh, we do that actually very closely with government. And, you know, the government itself is not like a monolith. There's parts that are strong and weak, whether you talk about it like at a sectoral level, like that's why we partner with the Ministry of Rural Development because we like them and they're, they're like have a, a strong sort of alignment with regard to their strategy and ours. And then also, like, when you look at it state by state level, like, India is, like, really big, and every state is pretty diverse, uh, even when you talk about its governance. And so there's certainly specific states <laughs> that we've had more success in, and then there's other states, like, we've just not even gone to because, like, they just don't have the investments of infrastructure or people or whatever budget for them to even play with us. Um, yeah, so that's one. <laughs> with regard to like the the corruption issue, uh, we have not really faced it. The main reason is agriculture and rural development is like the sector that has not that much money, <laughs> right? So if you're a corrupt person, like you should go to another sector. <laughs> you should go to like the public works department. <laughs> you should go to defense. These are good sectors. <laughs> but like agriculture, like there's not much money to be had here. Even like, you're, what are you gonna do? Like steal like a truck of carrots? Yeah, we've gotten stopped by like police like who have like been like, hey, maybe we do want to steal your truck of carrots. <laughs> but like that's, uh, you know, petty, like kind of like uh, corruption. You, we don't see like the massive kind of like corruption that, that probably still exists, but in, in other sectors. <laughs> okay, right, now go ahead. Have you guys ever thought of or have you done it where the seller can pay through Paytm at a discount to the farmer while the thing is being loaded, while the uh, while the objects are being loaded onto the truck. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's basically the idea, like what you're suggesting is basically the idea of the futures market auction. So actually what we've done is not to do like an, in, in advance, like because like this is a massive change of behavior, like no traders or farmers have ever like <coughs> set contracts with each other in advance of Pay the season. Pay for something before they see it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but so the way that we're doing it is with these very same farmers and traders who we've been working with for two years and they've been just trading and getting like the spot price, right? They take the produce to market and then spot price, they pay them back. So the only new like sort of nudge that we're trying with them is to be like one day before. <laughs> just give us your sell orders farmers with your min price that you're willing to sell it at and trader, what's your buy order and what's your max price that you're willing to pay? Basically run an auction, contract them, put in like a deposit, right, that you've contracted so that you don't like run away. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, and then basically at the time of loading, you're already like locked in, right, to a deal. So this, yeah, is pretty more recent for us and it, it is a really big, change in behavior. And so we're basically letting the farmers and traders experiment. So either they can use a subset of produce and do it spot, or uh, do the futures kind of play. Okay, right. <laughs> Go ahead, Julia. Um, this is a question of me trying to understand the best organizational structure to address social problems. Um, we've got a wide range of options here. We've got social enterprise. We've got CSR under uh, private sector companies, we've got NGOs, we've got 
weird uh, kind of structure of companies like ThoughtWorks, they actually took uh, CSR as a pillar of their businesses. Uh, so just in your view, what's the uh, advantages and disadvantages of social enterprises addressing side level problems versus the other approaches? That's a great question, right? Sure, sure. I think it, it's, um, there's uh, many different, so so main thing is that if you look at the CSR groups, often it is for helping society, but often there's also a branding advantage to the company, right? So so how do you kind of balance that? And uh, on similarly, on I think the big challenge with social enterprises, I think the big benefit with social enterprises, is a new field, so I'll touch on that. And I, I, by social enterprise, I mean the way Rick and used it, double bottom line entrepreneurs are looking to have profits, revenues, and have social mission. The positive is that you're on a very sustainable trajectory, and that is much needed right now. So many amazing uh, social entrepreneurs and nonprofits spend so much of their time fundraising. And it's a different power dynamic sometimes when there's a grantee versus where a social enterprise and your equity partner, you're more a partner. So there's some advantages there. On the flip side, I think comes in the factor of it's at this moment, I think it's harder to raise capital actually because the philanthropists often only fund the nonprofits. The investors, even some of the impact investors, are so used to funding for profit that, and there is an inherent mindset often that you think that if there is a social impact, there must be, it will be lower profits. So it's very hard to get seed capital for social enterprise. But the second, second, I won't call it a disadvantage, but something to think about is as a social enterprise, if you truly want to also achieve mission, you have to trade off these two things, the two goals, making profits and um, having mission. And how do you, when, when it's really, really tough, how are you going to make those trade offs is going to be very important. And there is a whole spectrum of investors and entrepreneurs, how they'll make those trade offs. There is no standards, really, in a sense. So that is one of the challenges. And um, on, on the impact investing side, again, it's a spectrum that people, some are doing it for branding, then there are, there are philanthropists or foundations who are getting into impact investing as a way of doing the very mission driven, then the whole spectrum in between. And so, so in all of this, again, I think having a common language on what, how much mission is okay, at least transparency so everyone knows that if I'm a social enterprise, this much weightage on mission and this much on profits, even if that was communicated, that would be powerful. And I just want to give one example, if I may, um, Richard, because this is something, that, because this mindset that you can't make money, while you can't be as good as just a business entrepreneur who's just there to make money, I want to share that, and since we're talking of agriculture, at Stanford Angels, one of our investments, early investments, was a company called Blue River Technologies in the agri field. Uh, robotics and uh, business school graduates came together and uh, started uh, broad robotics and computer vision to transform the farming industry. And what they came up with is a very low cost way of reducing the amount of herbicides used, bringing automated thinning of like uh, crops where you need to get rid of a lot of the um, originally sown crops. So it's been, it's really disrupted the agriculture industry here. Recently, and the reason I mentioned them that they were acquired for 305 million by John Deere recently because of the industry and tech disruption there. And this is an example of a mission-driven ent social enterprise that actually got very good returns by investors. So it's very doable, it's just harder, especially if it's not in the core strategy to think of both mission and uh, profits. But they also had an exit. And this is an interesting concept when yeah. you're dealing with a social enterprise yes. because exit is often something more to do with sustainability than it is with maximizing capital gain. True. And not that it can't maximize yes. capital gain, which yes. is your point. But that's a great complex answer to a complex situation. We're about out of time. I'm going to ask one last question to both of you, and we'll, we'll adjourn and have informal discussion over refreshments. So there are lots of new opportunities. Technology is the oil that's making this whole kind of endeavor go much better than it ever has before. What advice would you give to someone who is considering either making an investment in their own time or an investment of money in some sort of social enterprise? What would be the advice? 
I would say look at what's happening with cutting edge technology. The kind of efficiencies and uh, possibilities are just unprecedented and don't fear technology. Of course, be very thoughtful on the negative externalities, but what you're able to do with AI at this moment and big data analytics is very transformative. So look at what's there and think of it as augmenting what you're doing, not as a substitute. Okay, we can. Um, I guess one one sort of like reflection that we've had over these years is that technology is really only good at magnifying human intent and capability. Mm -hmm. And related to like Radhika's points, if those things are not right or are not fully built, then things could easily go awry, even with like the best of intentions. Yeah. <laughs> and so where we found success and what you know what I'd say like to spend time is like to think about like how technology is sort of like building on perhaps foundational sort of existing infrastructure investments in like people, institutions, finance, and political s systems. If those things are somewhat reasonable, <laughs> then like something like some technology, like whether it's videos, buying for farmers or transportation or some other totally different thing, like that's when you'll find like those have the most um, effect and, and both in terms of like shareholder value and, and ultimate like impact for the communities that it serves. Okay, that's <laughs> great. Thanks everyone for coming. Please join me in thanking our panelists. This is great. Thank you. 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 Thank you.